Let's open up in prayer. Dear Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your presence here this morning. Father, we thank you, Father, for filling us with the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for forgiving of us, forgiving us of our sins, Lord, so we may come to your throne of grace with a righteous mind and a righteous heart, Father. There are so many things that we need to pray for in this land, Father. We pray for all of our troops and all the people and all the Christians in Afghanistan, Father, that you would send your mighty angels to protect them, to put that protection around them, Father, that you can provide for each one of us, Lord, that they would glorify your name through this experience, Father, that they would feel uh, your love and your grace, Father God in heaven. Please provide for them, direct them, speak knowledge and wisdom into all who want to help these people, Father God in heaven, and show them the way to get out of Af Afghanistan, get out of harm's way. Father, we want to pray for our troops. We want to pray for all the ministries that are going to support uh, this effort. Father, we just lift these things to you. We write these on our petition, Father. We want to pray for this nation, Lord God in heaven, for the lost in this nation, for the lost across the globe. Lord God in heaven, we want to ask you, Jesus, that you would just fill our lives with joy, with hope, with love, with grace, with mercy. Father, do a mighty work in us, Lord. And as the body, give us the strength and the boldness to stand strong, to stand as one voice, Father, one heart, one mind, and that is your voice, your heart, your mind, Father, that we will not be overcome, Father, because you are our king, you are our leader, Father, God in heaven, and we follow you, we serve you with all our hearts, minds, and soul. So thank you for that, Jesus. And we just want to lift up all those who come to our hearts and minds, Father, who need your love and your grace and your mercy. So in these things, we just lift to you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray and say amen. So um, last week, we uh, left off on uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses uh, 30 and 31. And we learned a little bit about Joshua a little bit more, and we learned a lot about Rahab and her role. Recall, she was a prostitute, but she also was the one who protected the spies that Joshua sent out to spy on the city. She not only protected them, but when the king found out, she actually had to provide an excuse and a lie, uh, quite honestly that she had not seen them or she had not known of them. And the deal that she made in faith with Joshua and with God is that uh, she and her family would be protected. And she had a lot of faith uh, asking for that request. And, and we learned that, yes, God is true. God is faithful. God answered her prayers. And before the city was destroyed, Jericho was destroyed, she, was, she left. She was protected by the army that Joshua had brought. And remember, Joshua heard from the commander of the armies. And he was obedient. And he spread the message to the Israelites. And they were obedient by walking around the wall of Jericho for seven days, blowing trumpets on command and shouting. And the wall fell. And it was a great example of how much faith we need to have when God is speaking into us, when God is telling us and providing and directing our lives. If we just take a minute and we listen and we show our obedience and our love for God, how he will work in our lives and work through our lives for his glory. And we see that both in Joshua and Rahab. We've seen that last week. This week, we're going to continue on in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to cover verses 32 through 35. 
And what the author is doing, as he's done all along in chapter 11, he brings example uh, after example after example of the faith the men and women of the Old Testament and of the New Testament had or have in the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. When they put their faith in the Lord, we can see how God answers our prayers. And faithfully, he answers. And it's just amazing. We're going to learn about these people. And we've heard these stories before, but in context of how much faith they had. It's not the actions and the results of the actions. It's the faith that provided both their ability to act and their ability to see God in action and answer the prayers and the covenants and the vows that these people made. And it just reminds me that it doesn't just happen in the Old Testament. It doesn't happen in the first century New Testament. It happens today. It happens in our lives today when we go to God in faith and we ask the Lord in faith and we pray righteously and we pray that the Lord will edify us and grow us and make us more righteous. God will answer those prayers. And there are prayers that if you want to pray for riches, God may or may not answer. Most likely, if it is not going to edify you, if it's not going to glorify God, and it will destroy you, God will not answer those prayers of, of riches. Or, let me put it this way, of selfish prayers. God does not like selfish prayers. And we have to remember that as we go to his throne. And when we make a vow or make a promise to God in prayer, we better do our best to uphold what we are uh, promising to the Lord. And we better make sure that we count those costs because God will hold us accountable for those things that we offer to him in, in covenant. And we're going to read today someone who did that and was surprised by the result. But we also see in faith that he kept his end of the vow of his covenant he made with God at great price. So I'm not suggesting you don't make these covenants and these vows with God, but make sure you count your costs and make sure your heart is right. And when you go to prayer and you build a petition of prayer, of requests, make sure that they will edify you, that they will glorify God. Because God will absolutely hear and answer those prayers in the positive, in the affirmative. Amen. So, let's get going because there's a lot to cover today. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 32 through 35. Title of the message is a continuation from last week's message, Overcoming Adversity Through Faith in God. This is part two. So, do you think, do you know, God is ready to use you when you are ready to step out in faith? Do you know that God is ready to use you when you are ready to step out in faith? God is always on the ready, and he's always preparing in the background, and he is waiting for us to step out in faith. And as we've been reading and studying the men and women of the Bible with faith, we should by now understand, have a deep understanding that it is our faith and the steps that we take in faith that God honors. He will honor those steps of faith. He will honor us so we may in turn honor him. He will bless us in faith. He blesses us because without faith, we have a hard time believing in God. It is through our faith 
that we know God is real. It is through our faith we know that his son is the only way to the Father. It is through that faith that we can't see, but we know exists, that will get us into the kingdom of heaven for eternity. It's that faith. So God waits on us because God is always ready to receive us. He is always willing to receive us. He tells us. He tells us in Matthew to go out and make disciples of all nations, of all men, all women, all children. Why does he say that? Because his arms are wide open and he is waiting. He is waiting for us to come because he is prepared. And remember what Jesus says, Jesus will go away to prepare a mansion in heaven for us. He's already taken the steps to prepare those mansions, but he's waiting for us. Do you think your life has to be perfect to be used by God and to have great faith? Do you need a perfect life? God is the one who will make us righteous. God will come in and he will shave the edges off of us, the rough edges. God is the one who will separate us from the world. We just need to take that step of faith and move forward. We do not have to be perfect. We will be perfect in the Lord Jesus Christ. We will be perfect in God if we allow him to work and change our lives. That is the good news that we have and that we celebrate. The good news that we can come to the Lord broken. And if we come to the Lord broken every day, every day the Lord will fix us. The requirement is going to the Lord, not trying to fix yourself first, not trying to worry about, am I worthy enough to go to God? God knows, and we should know, we are not worthy enough. But through God's grace in his son, he provides a way for us to get there. And he's waiting. He's waiting for us. Do you believe God can use you where you are? I do. I believe God uses every circumstance to glorify himself when we allow that. If we continue to push God away, God will allow us to push away from the table. And if we decide never to return, God will allow that too. But he will take you in your sinful nature, where you are, and he will use you. Remember Rahab, she was a prostitute, but she had so much faith. She knew when Joshua was coming, God had spoken to her that the town, Jericho, the city, was going to be destroyed. And she decided to get on the right side of God and do the right thing. And it turns out that through her lineage, you can trace her marriage all the way down to the Lord Jesus Christ. So God knew. God knew at that moment how he was going to use Rahab. Generation after generation after generation. She had no idea. Joshua had no idea, I suspect. But God knew. So God can use us exactly where we are at. We just need to be bond servants for the Lord. And we need to serve him with all our hearts, minds, soul, without question. And be obedient to him in faith, and he'll do it. Do you believe living in faith every day is a blessing to God? Every day that you experience a faith moment or you share your faith with someone, is that pleasing to God? I believe it absolutely is. I believe that the Lord is pleased every time we share him with someone. I believe the Lord is pleased every time we glorify his name. I believe the Lord is pleased every time we, with an open heart and an open mind, want to serve him 
with all our hearts and all our minds and soul and strength. I believe God is very pleased with us. So when you show those acts of faith, when you take those steps, when you believe God can use you where you are at, and you become a bondservant for Christ, God is very pleased with us. And that should matter because where we end up for eternity should matter to you. Whether you end up in the lake of fire in hell or whether you end up in the kingdom of heaven in glory, it's up to us. It's up to us to decide where we want to end up. And through our faith, we will end up in God's glory in the kingdom of heaven. So I already gave you a bunch of background on Joshua, Rahab, Israel, the acts that they performed, marching around the wall of Jericho, protecting the spies, all through an act of faith that they had in the Lord Jesus Christ. God came and spoke to them, and they were obedient in their faith to follow God's direction. This week, there are so, a numerous examples that we're going to cover today. And each one shows that they, A, are human, B, at times waned in faith, and C, did the right thing. In the final analysis, they did the right thing and followed God. Which just goes to prove that we are human. God understands we are human. God understands there is a human element to each and every one of us. But through the Holy Spirit from Jesus, those elements can be molded into the righteous men and women and children that God wants us to be if we stay faithful and obedient to Him. When we make a vow, it is so important that you understand and you count the cost when you make a vow to God that once you make that vow, you keep it because God will hold us accountable for the vows that we make and break. It is very, very important. We understand those vows. We understand what we are doing when we come to the throne of grace with our petitions and our prayers. It's very important. So let's get into Scripture. Let's look at Hebrews 11, 32 through 35. And I'm reading out of the New King James Version, so if you have a different version, please follow along. And what more shall I say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. And 35, women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they may obtain a better resurrection. There is so much there that we are going to break down that it, we need to understand in verse 32, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel. We know David. We know Samuel. There's, we've read so much about them. Barak, do you know? Samson, we know. Jephthah, do you know? These are all men that had great faith, but also were imperfect men. So we have to remember this. God will use us where we are. He will make us perfect, even though we are imperfect, which is beautiful. So let's start out. I'm going to go through each one of these men, give you a little bit of background, and then we'll jump into some supporting scripture. Gideon was thrashing the wheat while the angel came to visit. 
And if you look at Judges 6.11, which we'll look at in a minute, we'll find out what he was doing. Gideon had an army or had access to an army of 32,000 men. And when God called him to come to action, called him to action, he thought, wow, I have 32,000 men at my access. This should be a pretty easy go. But guess what God did? God told him, I don't want you to take the 32,000. I want you to take 300. And then you hear a bill, a big gulp out of Gideon. What are you talking about, Lord? 300. I'm going to go against these massive armies with 300 men. And Gideon, before every battle, had to ask the Lord to show him a sign. And every single time God did, God came through. Gideon had to count his cost. Show me a sign, Lord, I'll be faithful. Show me a sign, Lord, I'll be faithful. That vow that was made, God showed him a sign. Gideon was faithful. And with 300 men, what happened? His men blew trumpets, held torches, and overtook the Midianites and Amalekites and others with armies with vast numbers of soldiers. It didn't matter how big the armies were. God delivered the armies into Gideon's hands because God's glory is more important than what we see in front of us. And Gideon seen large armies with 300 men and was fearful. Fear versus God's glory. I will take God's glory every single time because fear comes from the enemy. Fear comes from Satan. Fear does not come from God. And the vow that Gideon made, God fulfilled. And he overtook the armies. He believed and he moved forward. Let's talk about Barak. Barak, Deborah, a prophetess, would sit in judgment of Israel. She called upon Barak because God gave her a word. And Barak listened to her word, but tried to make an agreement. I will go to Mount Tabor with my army if you come with me. So his faith seemed like it was more in Deborah than it was in God, because he knew that she was a prophetess and God was speaking through her. And if he, she was there, he would succeed. But as it turns out, God spoke and said, if you show up and you go, he will defeat the army and he will deliver great victory over Sisera. And by the way, Sisera had, it says in the Bible, over 900 chariots made of iron. So a massive army of chariots. Remember what the chariot represented in the Old Testament. A very powerful war. I'll give you an equivalent in today's um, standards. An M1 tank that the U.S. provides. A massive, powerful machine. The M1 tank. The fastest tank. The most powerful tank in the world. The equivalent to that tank was an iron chariot. So this is what Barack was coming up against. And he finally was obedient in faith to the Lord. And the Lord handed him that victory. Let's look at Samson. We all know the story of Samson. He was called to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines in Judges 13.5. The Spirit of the Lord fell upon Samson four different times as recorded in the Bible. Once, a lion attacked him, Judges 14.9. Twice, to fight the Philistines, Judges 14.19 and 15.14. He was a Nazarite, or a Nazarite, <laughs> chosen to complete a vow for God. His faith came at the end of his life, not during his life, because we know that he was married. We know what happened with Delilah. 
and we know that he lost his strength. But in the end, at the end of his life, he prayed for that strength to come back. And what did God do? God delivered him because he was broken. He was done. God had to empty him. And God rebuilt him with that faith. And through the faith, we know the end of the story. We know that Samson destroyed the city. He won great battles over the Philistines. If you look at Judges 13, 24, and 25, we'll look at some of this in a minute. Jephthah, he was remarkable in keeping his faith. And this is a, a story. He is another commander of an army. He was called to take on the Ammon's army, which was a large army. And God promised him also that he would deliver the army into his hands, the Ammon army, into his hands if he was faithful. But what he did is he made a vow to God. The first person that comes out of my front door who celebrates victory, I will offer to you, Father, as a burnt offering. That's the vow he made. So he goes off to war. He's faithful. God delivers the Ammon army into his hands. He comes back home. He's standing in his front area on the front porch. Guess who comes out of the front door? His only child, his daughter, in celebratory garb or wardrobe. It was customary if you want to battle back in the Old Testament times that the women would gather together and they would dance and they would sing and they would praise over the victory. His daughter did that, trying to surprise him. So she was the first one out of the door. What did Jeff have, have to do? He had to honor his vow with God. And he offered up his daughter as a birth, birth, uh, burnt offering. And she lamented. She lamented because she knew she could bear children. She knew she could get married. But the vow that he had made with God set her position with God for the rest of her life. She was to become a virgin and stay, or she was to stay a virgin for the rest of her life, unable to marry, unable to bear children. That is counting costs. That is making a vow with God. Make sure you count the costs. Make sure you understand the vow you are making. Now, to Jep, uh, Jephthah's credit, he kept that vow. But it's through his faith that God delivered the army and through his obedience of being a servant and loving God that he kept his end of the vow. And she lamented. He allowed her to go to the mountain for four days and to lament what she was about to um, encompass or entail. The life that she was now given was not the life she probably predicted. But God provided. And God came through. Let's look at David. He's the only king mentioned here in uh, the Hebrew author scripture. So let's see what he's done. We all know that David is a man after God's heart. 1 Samuel 13, 14. The people heard God. In 1 Chronicles 11, 1 through 3, they wanted David to be the king after he, he fought the Philistine. And one, God appointed his king, 1 Samuel 16, 1. God's the one who appointed the king. Not David, not the people. God called David to be the king. And through faith, and through David's faith, and David's actions... 
he created an environment, created an environment where the people wanted him also to be the king. So God was glorified through David's faith because he was faithful enough to know that if he does God's work, God will protect, God will provide. That's a message. And we need that message more and more today. We need that message more than ever with everything that's going on, with COVID, with lockdowns, with governments not making sense, with messaging being so confusing that it's coming straight from Satan himself. This is the faith we need to understand when God speaks to us and God directs us that we follow his direction to the T and not worry about what the world is going to think of you and not worry about the outcome that the world has for you. What we should be worried about and concerned about is our eternal life. Where will we spend it, in hell or in heaven? That's what we need to worry about. And that's where faith will take us, to that place where we can make a decision, where we can understand without doubt that if we follow the Lord Jesus Christ, he will pull us into that place called heaven. He has prepared us a place, a mansion for us. And it is waiting there for us. All we need to do is receive it. Receive Him. Believe in Him. Give our lives over to Him. Make a vow that you will live the rest of your days for the Lord Jesus Christ. And keep that vow. Because we see through these men of faith that when they made vows, God kept His end of the bargain. When God vows that he will deliver us and direct us and provide for us and guide us into heaven, we have evidence upon evidence and upon example that God keeps his promises. Let's look at Samuel. He's the first prophet, 1 Samuel 3.20. He manifests the prophetic gift in his youth, and when uh, the central sanctuary at Shilon was destroyed by the Philistines and the Ark of the Covenant, the Palladium of Israel's nationhood, taken into captivity, it was he who proved equal to the task of uh, rallying the shattering moral of his people, 1 Samuel 7, 9 through 11. His faith is recorded in numerous events. In numerous events. Remember, he was a seer, so he also served David. And it's just awesome to see how God throughout will use kings, will use prophets, will use just general people, people that we have no idea that God has a plan to use. So when we are, you know, dealing with people, keep in mind, God may be using them and your life. Or God may be using you in their life for his glory. And this is where respect and love and and the grace that God pours into us and the mercy that God gives us, we should be pouring out to others. That is what true faith is believing that God is going to do a mighty work in us to do a mighty work through us so we may share the love of Christ that is poured into us with others, with no hope, who are despair, who have despair, who cannot see tomorrow, cannot see an hour from now, live in darkness. We are the light. We are the ones that come. We are the ones that are called by God. And the covenant that we make with God is to be used for God's will, not ours, not our will be done, but your will be done. Remember what Jesus said in Gethsemane, pass this cup by my lips, 
but your will be done, Father. And we know what happens. Another act of faith through Jesus. Jesus knew he was going. He was going to the cross. He knew the outcome. But yet he said, Father, your will be done. There is so much, so much strength in faith. There is so much strength in the faith that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ to guide, guide us and protect us and to provide for us. All we need is a little. Remember, as small as a mustard seed, Jesus will do the rest. The Holy Spirit in us will do the rest. We just need to believe that small and let the faith grow and grow and grow until the point that we get into the kingdom of heaven. And it's just, it's a beautiful message. You don't have to be perfect to serve God. God will perfect us. It doesn't matter what position you hold in this world. What matters is what position you hold in the kingdom of heaven. That's what matters. Verse, let's get into some scripture here. Judges 6.11, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the uh, terebinth, tree which was in Ophrah which belonged to Joash the Abizarite while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites remember the Midianites took over and they were stealing all the wine they were stealing all the grapes so Gideon was threshing the wheat they were stealing the wheat all the food and he suppressed that action in a wine press and hid it, the threshing of that wheat, to make the bread, to eat. But the angel of the Lord came and sat under the tree. And he came and spoke to Gideon at that point. Look at Judges 4, 6, and 7. Then she sent and called for Barak. She is Deborah, the son of Ebenom from Kadesh in Nephali, and said to him, has not the Lord, God of Israel, commanded? Go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor. Take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Naphtali and the sons of Zebulun. And against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude at the river Kishon. And I will deliver him into your hand. Again, another vow that God makes to us. He will deliver these armies. You do what I say, I will deliver. I will keep my promise. I will be with you. Let's look at Judges 13, 24, and 25. So the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to move upon him. At Mahane. Dan, between Zorah and Estale. Remember, the Lord fell upon him. The Holy Spirit fell upon Samson four different times on four different occasions because the Lord moved upon him and was pleased with him. Judges 11, 1 and 2. Now, Jephthah, the uh, Gileadite, was a mighty man of valor, but he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead begot Jephthah. Gilead's wife bore sons, and when his wife's son grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall have no inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. So look at his upbringing, but look how God used him. Again, another example, Rahab. Look at how God will use us when we step out in faith. 1 Samuel 16.1 Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. God is telling them, I 
have provided myself a son, not you, me, because God knew they needed a king after God's own heart. In 1 Samuel 13, 14, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. You have not followed the vows in the commands that God had given you. God brings in his own man after his own heart. And we know that is David. 1 Samuel 3.20, And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. So we know, and all the men and women knew, Samuel was a prophet speaking on behalf of God. He was a godly man, and it gave him much, much credence when he spoke, especially speaking on behalf of the Lord. People would listen. He was a man of faith, and God spoke to him and spoke through him. And it's, it's interesting how we look at these men and women of all shapes and sizes, all different disciplines. Like I said, kings, commanders of armies, regular people. God will use us all. We just need to take that step of faith. And through adversity, we need to keep our faith because this is the other half of the message. It's not just that we have faith, but God will put us in circumstances, very adverse circumstances, to grow our faith and to ensure that we are following God's word and what God wants to do. In verse 34, quenched, the violence of fire escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became uh, valiant in battle, and turned to flight the armies of the aliens. And we're talking about the violence of fire. So there are several things that are going on here. We see the violence of fire. We see escape, the edge of the sword. We see what they did. Weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle. Turn the flight of the armies and the aliens. Let's look at Daniel 6.22. This is important. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. God protected Daniel in the lion's den. Matter of fact, if you continue to read the story, the accusers were thrown into the lion's den, eaten by the lions. That's how awesome God is in his promises of faith. In us. Let's look at verse 34. That was 33, I read. Who through faith in 34 quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. So in verse 33, I, I read out of order here. I'll just give you 33. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions. That is Daniel. In 34, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Let's look at Daniel 3rd, 23 through 25. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach and Abed, uh, Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king, look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. And it continues on here, Daniel uh, 26 through 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fire, fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire, and the satraps, administers, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. 
The hair of their hair was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of the fire was not on them. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Remember, these guys refuse to worship a 90-foot statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel refused to eat the king's food. And look at what God, through their faith, look at how God delivered them. Out of the lion's den, out of the furnace. When we put the context of faith and how much faith they had in our direct field of view, we understand it is God is the one who delivered. God is the one who kept his vow. God is the one who says, when you follow me, I will protect you. I will provide for you. I will give you guidance. I will give you direction. It is God is not us. Verse 35 says, Women receive their dead, raised to life again, others tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. So let's look. 1 Kings 17, 20 through 22. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? And he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, my God, I pray, let this child so come back to him. And verse 22, then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came back to him and he revived. We see these acts of resurrection throughout the Bible, throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament. When we have faith, when Elijah had faith to cry out to the Lord, the Lord heard him. And it's so interesting that we can have that same faith. As a matter of fact, when Jesus sent the disciples out, what did he tell them to do? In Matthew 10, 8, Jesus says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received freely you give as disciples of Christ who we are freely Jesus gives us freely we need to receive it freely we need to give it to others everybody will question well we cannot raise the dead in context here a lost soul a non-believer is dead and what do we do we take in context and we say we are going to deliver you through the Lord Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit living in us. It is through the power of Christ that you will be delivered. We are just a mere transport layer to do that. What I mean by transport layer, we are the ones God will speak into us. God gives us the word. We share the word. It's through that Holy Spirit. It's through the grace of Christ that will work in your lives. It's not our work that is done. We are just a vessel. We are just a transport layer. We are a vessel to be used by God. And each one of these men and the women that we read upon who had great faith, you know, the women who lost their children, Elijah comes in. And he comes in and he lays himself out for God to do a mighty work through him. To build the faith in this woman that God loves Elijah, but God loves this child. God loves this woman so much that he is willing to work through Elijah because Elijah was willing to have God work through him. And these are the things that we have to be reminded of. When we go to God, just as these men and women did, to pray, God will hear our prayers. God will ask, what does he want? What do we want? And we tell him righteously. We come to him 
and we share what we want that will edify us, that will continue us to grow in the kingdom of heaven. That's what we ask for. Jesus calls the disciples to raise the dead. We are disciples to raise the dead. Now, does he equip us? Yes. Is it through our power? No. It is through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ that the dead will be risen. It is through the grace of God, through the grace and mercy and love that God has that the dead will be risen. We were all dead at one time before God came into our lives, before we decided to become bondservants of God. We were all dead. A non-believer, according to Scripture, is dead. Sure, they're alive in the world, but they are dead in the kingdom of heaven. Would you rather be alive in the kingdom of heaven and dead to the world? That's a choice that we have to make. And a choice that we're going to have to make is coming soon. And you have no more time. Time is short. If your faith is small, allow Jesus through the Holy Spirit to build that faith in your life. And finally, give your whole life to Christ. Let's look at this verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. The escape here that Paul is talking about is through the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us the off-ramp. If you are tempted and you call out on Christ and you pray and you get on your knees with your whole heart that you want to be delivered, Christ will provide deliverance for you. This is what Paul is telling us. The only temptation he's telling us here comes from Satan in the world. It doesn't come from God. God does not tempt us. God provides for us. God protects us. God delivers us from temptation. He does not tempt us into the kingdom of heaven. He wishes that we would live there, but he gives us free will and choice to decide. That's what God does. God will do that, and every time you call upon God to ask, that God will deliver it. Let's look at our conclusion, our closing remarks. In our walk with Christ, we often think of ourselves as not worthy of the blessings God has for us. We think if we ask, God will not hear or we are not worthy for God to answer. The question becomes, are you seeking righteousness in your prayer? Are you seeking and asking God to have you grow in his righteousness? Are you someone who seeks for your own personal pleasure? You go to God asking for the pleasures that you desire. Or do you go and do you ask for the things that God has for you that will build you into the Christian man, woman, or child God has made you to be? James 4, 2, and 3, you lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive. Now listen to this very carefully. Because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your own pleasures. Every time that we go to God and we ask him for something that will tear us or separate us from him, God will not give that to us. Because God knows how easy it is to jump back into the world, into the sinful nature that we have. That's why God does not answer those prayers. And you say, well, there's a bunch of rich people around that are Christians. Yes, they must be able to handle what God has given them. But if you don't have it and you've been asking and asking and asking, you must check your soul. You must check your heart. You must check your mind because God apparently knows that you, it will destroy you. 
These are the things that we need to recognize as we go to the throne of grace. That we just can't go haphazardly asking for any silliness of the world that the world has to offer. Because God wants us to build us into the children, to be in the kingdom of heaven. When we approach God's throne, we need to make sure your mind is right, your heart is pure. It is through a righteous mind and a pure heart that God will move in us to edify us, to grow us, to bless us. Faith is a critical element in our development in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is necessary to reach the kingdom of heaven. Let me say that again. Faith is necessary to reach the kingdom of heaven. Without faith, we have no hope. We become just as the world wants you to be. The world wants your total dependence on it, not God. If we live in the world, then how can we live in the kingdom of heaven also? It is impossible to serve two masters as Jesus teaches us in the Bible. In faith, these men and women we learned about today decided to have faith in God and not the world. In every aspect of our life, we should be able to display the faith we have in God. In good times and in times of adversity, nothing is impossible for our God. It is through our faith in Christ that carries us and instills in us the endurance we need to be followers of Him, God and His Son, Jesus. And if you don't believe that, go to God with a righteous mind and a righteous heart. Meditate on asking God what he has for you in your life. What to look forward to. And give him time. Don't spend two minutes. Don't spend 30 seconds. If it takes a half hour, meditate. Allow God to start speaking to you. Open your ears. Open your heart. If you don't know how to do that, and if you have not given your life to Christ, just ask the Lord. It is so simple. Father, forgive me of my sins. I repent of these things, Father, that are of the world. I want to release the world, Father, and become a bondservant for you, to serve you for the rest of my days, to understand that your son is the only way he is the truth and the light, the only way to your Father. And when I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, when I give my life to Christ, when I start to serve you, Father God in heaven, I will find that place that you have prepared for me in the kingdom of heaven. It is that simple. There's no other reason why we cannot ask the Lord for those things that edify us. There is no reason why we should be holding back the th blessings that God has for us. So let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we just thank you, Lord, for your message today. We thank you for all the examples of the men and women in faith in the Bible, Father, that you've brought to our minds, that you've uh, brought to our attention, Lord, as examples, Father. They were all imperfect, as we are imperfect, Father, but you used them because they had faith, they had obedience. Father, my prayer is that every ear that hears this message would change your mind, change your hearts, and believe that we are worthy, Father, to serve you where we are at. Lord God in heaven, the act of faith of receiving you, receiving your son is what is required of us. So Lord, we thank you. We want to pray for our troops. We want to pray for the Christians in Afghanistan. We want to lift to you once again, Father, all those who are coming to our hearts and minds for healings, for spiritual healings, physical healings, Lord God in heaven, for that financial healings. But more importantly, Father, that we would all keep our eyes focused on you as the times become more tumultuous, Father, and the days get darker, Lord, we look on the hill to see your light shining in our lives, that we may take your light and shine it on those who are hopeless, who are loveless, who find and feel no love, 
Father, so we just thank you, Lord, for using us abundantly, and we do step out in faith in you, in your word, in your kingdom, to serve you for the rest of our days. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we all say, amen. So thank you for joining us today. Um, to me, putting this message together was just awesome. I love uh, reading of men and women of faith and giving us examples. And the beautiful thing about the Holy Scripture is we can go back to it every time we forget. And we can go back to these men and women of faith and see exactly how God used them and how God will keep his promises and how they had faith to move when God said move. And if we can just become the same in the kingdom of heaven, we will do so much more work for God than what we could ever imagine. So have a blessed day. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. And if you need prayer or you need a Bible, please reach out to us. Love, Truth, and Spirit Ministries. Catch this message on YouTube uh, this afternoon. It will be up. We put all of our messages up there every week. And then join us. Don't forget, join us on uh, our Tuesday Bible study. And more importantly, standing in the gap together for prayer. So thank you. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Amen.